Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast for Stage 6 of the Tour de France Femme. Avec Zwift from Albi to Blagnac, maybe one of the most moderate stages without theoretically the most excitement for the week, but actually it offered a lot today, both in the stage and before, with some drama, Benji. The drama of yesterday yeah. with the volering uh, 20 second penalty, that got a lot worse for SD Works, or maybe better, depending on where, which way you look at it, uh, this morning. <laughs> Yes, indeed. We had um, Danny Stum, the DS, came out after we recorded the podcast yesterday, criticizing the UCI commissaire, saying that, or oh, should they be leading this tour de France Femme when it comes to their decision making? So he was not happy. And I don't think I've seen a single comment supporting what Danny Stum said anywhere. So I think everyone has unanimously decided that what Danny Stum said was wrong. That was not okay because it was clear to me rewatching the tape so many times that there should have been a time penalty and she's kind of lucky that it's 20 seconds. Now, okay, we're going to the evening. That's what we see. The riders like Volring and so forth. She didn't necessarily know directly after the race. She had an interview afterwards where the Belgian media kind of told her for the first time. And I always hated when, when riders get to know something the first time in a media interview, because then you've got a minute of the interviewer just asking, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about that? And oh, I, that's so cringe, I can't stand it. But anyway, they were on the page, the SD work page of, okay, we didn't really do anything wrong. We don't see what we did wrong. We cross forward to this morning and we got a new message. I saw a new message on the internet by UCI Media, right? UCI Media has been active. <laughs> Whoever runs that Twitter account has been, holy shit, they've been working overtime this week. They had to send three tweets this week. Um, yeah, Stam has been excluded from the race, not just for his incident in the car yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm pretty sure he got excluded from the race rather than just 200, 500 Swiss franc fine because of his comments. And his comments weren't just, I disagree with the decision. I don't really understand what I did wrong. He actually, like he attacked the commissaires. He even went verbally. To like he even went to the extent of like attacking their integrity, saying that SD yep. Works are being like unfairly targeted. Just that they, the UCI, the commissaires wants like AVV to win the race. He was implying it's. I mean, I'm not in the SD Works team bus. I feel like I've been very critical already this week, and I don't like doing it to the same team over and over. But um, yeah, the environment in that team to me looks really bad, and. Yep. You saw. Toxic. You mentioned that in the documentary. You saw. I obviously can't get the context. My Dutch, whilst it, I am fluent, I can't get the full context. And, and just there's just no. Like it doesn't matter, man. Like okay, uh, for sure. In the heat of the moment, I also have a fuse. And in sports, I also blo you know have blown up whatever. But this is like afterwards. You're not going to change the twenty second penalty. How can they not? And even this morning, like he's woken up a new day. And if you, I always think with people, how are they the next day? They've slept on it. They've woken up. Maybe they say, you know what? Yesterday I was a hothead. I fucked up. Yeah. Twenty second penalty could have been worse. In fact, I'm I'm glad Demi's okay. And you know we go forward. But this morning, Stam's like, oh, I, I still don't know what the problem is. It's like, well, then you're the problem, and actually you shouldn't be in the race if that's how you think. Exactly. Now. As a follow-up to that, that's not just the only consequence for uh, SD Works. There's also tiny consequences everywhere because next to the 20 seconds, there's also other consequences in other classifications. Obviously, Volring doesn't care about the points classification. She might not even care about the QOM classification. But because of that, she's now on minus two points for the Queen of the Mountains classification, which is kind of intriguing because you've got this battle between Yara Kastelein, Annemiek van Vleuten and Volring when it comes to QOM right now. Before the stage that is upcoming that we're going to talk about, Kastelein is on 23 points, Van Vleuten on zero, and Volring, because of the penalty, on minus two. And there's only 25 points still available. So if Volring gets both climbs tomorrow, which is Aspin plus Tourmalet, she can still win QOM, depending on whether we saw Kastelein active today. And we suggested yesterday, will, she, will we see her in the breakaway? Will we see Phoenix trying to control the breakaways to make sure she can do it from the peloton? And, uh, well, we saw a different kind of breakaway on the road, right? April Tacey and uh, Rachel Nealon at the start. And when you saw a small breakaway at the start, were you, were you certain it was going to uh, be a controllable breakaway? Um, I thought it'd get brought back early like it often happens. And mm -hmm. then 
uh, a new break would go, particularly if they got brought back before the, before the last Category 4 climb. And, you know, these Cat 4 climbs, two riders is enough to mop up all those points in front of Castelline. So, yeah, Phoenix to Koenig, as she was maybe too close in GC to be allowed. I don't know. We couldn't watch it because coverage hasn't started yet. So we, we don't exactly know what happened in break formation. But, yeah, I think it would have been hard for Castelline to get in, frankly, on a minute. And it's also a lot to ask for her team to basically not allow any breakaway uh, to form at all. And with Vibas out, like I said yesterday, this is a huge opportunity for uh, Charlotte Cool and team, team DSM, for Chiara Consoni, for UAE, ADQ, for Mariana Voss on Team Yumbo Visma, where, you know, they got a realistic chance, above 10% chance each, of probably winning this stage, cool higher than that. So I really thought it would be a controlled sprint. Because mm -hmm. the parkour isn't that hard, and it's a short, what is it, 122K, so three-hour stay, no, maybe three and a half, no, three hours on the dot. I was like, they got to be able to control this, but I think the seven-woman teams and already some riders dropped out, it, it makes it really hard to control, especially if the riders attacking are actually really strong riders uh, mm -hmm. as well. That, And then maybe you compare, like, Emma Norsgaard, for example, <laughs> case in point, <laughs> to the the fifth or sixth rider in the hierarchy at, uh, you know, Yumbo or something. Like, they're much stronger, those sort of riders. Yeah. Lea Coudinier, for example, at DSM is the type of rider you'd see at the front of the peloton pacing, for example, which would be hard to bring back a three-man break, a three-woman breakaway with Emma Norsgaard, Agnieszka skalnak Soika, and Sandra Alonso. Alonso we know from sprints. She's, uh, she's had pretty good sprints in the past, and she rides from the Fortera set out. Is it Skalniak Soika is the kind of rider where she's been really bloody good this year, but is it necessarily from breakaway against Northgard and Alonso that she's very competitive? Not necessarily, but I still like seeing it. And then Northgard, we, we know she's good when it comes to lure type. She, she's pretty good at the Roubaix type parkour. She, I think, got second on Omlop behind Kopecky at a certain point in, uh, in recent years. She, she's done loads of stuff sprints in the past and so forth so she had a, s a slight transformation of rider type this year towards a bit less sprint a bit more versatile i would say and this break was up the road and i was thinking what's gonna happen who's gonna control but we're getting towards these hills we're getting towards these hills that are hard to control and there was this this one hill where i think it was the the Côte du Clos Portier but i'm not certain it was that one Labu was pacing over the top because DSM was probably like, we need to put our best climber at the front to make sure we can control the breakaway. But then you get the issue that your sprinter gets in trouble. And as Labu was rolling over the top of the summit, we saw at the back that Cole was dropping into a second group. And that's the kind of thing we always talk about when it comes to sprinting teams needing to reduce the tempo on the climb, which gives the breakaway a bit more option. While on the flat end... And it, well, well, on the flat section, they basically have to push through entirely to try and make it. And we saw that exact scenario, the opposite side of the coin here. So Cole is then behind after that hill, behind the peloton, 15 seconds. We see rider by rider of DSM waiting. And I was kind of waiting what would happen in the peloton. Because like other teams would have to take over. And it took a while, I feel like. But then UAE took over, right? In peloton to try and keep Cole behind. Yeah, they started pacing. I thought Yumbo, they moved riders to the front, and then you're like, well, maybe ST Works need to pace because Kopecky's not slow. Like, she can win this sprint too. So yeah. if these teams all collaborate, they can keep Cole behind, and uh, one of those three are guaranteed pretty much to win the stage. But And you also got to manage this breakaway too. You can't just wait for DSM to come back, and then they're going to have to recover because they've just done a chase as a team, and then they're going to go slow and, and not really bring the gap back too much. So... But anyway, they did come back. There was a crash by Ewers and Castelline. Ewers crashed pretty hard into a ditch, I think. Um, and yeah, that, but that was just on a straight road. Castelline got straight back up. And the gap's at 133. 33Ks to go. And, and you already mentioned her, but Skalniak Soika, she is, like, you look at her and you're like, oh, she's not, she's small, not that powerful, but she's actually like a TT specialist. And yeah. if there was... If there's a TT, I, I really want to see how she goes on Sunday in that Po TT that has two climbs. Because she's like, as I said, she's small, but well, not small, but like she's not like a, as big as Van Dyke or Royce. 
Yeah. But she's like won all of her races basically from her TT or using her TT on the road bike, um, like on the prologue last year at uh, Toscana. And yeah, she's like, she won the Polish TT championships. Her climbing to date, like in the La Vuelta, she disappointed, and in uh, UA Tour on her feet, I really expected because TT riders in the men usually on her feet, like Plap and Bilbao can do pretty well on that climb, but um, mm-hmm. wasn't that good. And then on Laguna Stanaya, she came tenth. I was like, all right, ahead of San Esteban. I was like, okay, she. I think there's a GC rider in there in Skalniak Soika, yeah. so I really want to see how she goes tomorrow and. And on Sunday, um, just as, yeah, just to give you some background on who she is and how I see her progressing. Yeah, she's 26 and she's been riding for quite a while, but um, I still think there's a lot of margin there. And so, yeah, I'm keen to see how she goes this weekend. But they're pulling really strong, three really strong riders. It did look, though, Benji, with when Yumbo, DSM, and UAE were all contributing, it looked pretty under control and the gap was coming down steadily. Like, it got to 5Ks to go. 18 seconds and it's coming down and if you're doing the maths on how much time they're losing per k it looks fine like it looks like they're gonna get caught with two k's to go and alonzo was fucked she like stopped pulling because she was about to drop and then i don't know what happened it just stalled i don't think Norsgaard was i, I can't have been holding back did they just run out of domestiques on the front I would argue that's a that's a theory. Obviously, with with Cole having come back, DSM was in that play, like you said. But the factor there is that we've got one less rider in the Tour de France Femme per team than we have in the Men's Tour de France, for example. So it's inherently harder for these teams to control a breakaway because they've got less domestiques to do so. And keeping in mind that DSM also kind of holds Labou half back just in case for GC still. So they got to keep that in mind when it comes to uh, Yumbo, Rihanna Marcus probably isn't going all out either when it comes to that stuff. UAE has two-ish, two-and-a-half-ish riders that are still trying to keep themselves up there in GC that are probably not going full either at the front of the group. So I think we need to keep all that in mind. And then you're left with like seven riders across the entire route that are that are domesticing, but some might have done the work at the start of the stage to control whatever breakaway actions there were. And then a bit later to control in the middle phase of the race. And then to bring Cole back to the peloton already. So we've got so many domestiques that have worked already at this point. And I really think that is impacting the ability of breakaways to be able to win these races, which is especially the reason why I was always so so fanatic about I want more breakaways. I want more people attacking. Because I always feel like the in your terms, that the sprinters teams are paper tigers in these races. And we kind of saw that happening, like you say, and the gap does keep dropping. Three kilometers to go, Alonso dropped off the front. So the gap went down to 18 seconds. And three kilometers, 18 seconds, if you've got enough domestiques, that can work out. But if you're limited, that's going to be a close one. And it was limited, but I think it got worse with what happened at 800 meters to go because they went through a chicane and we saw a Seratizid rider in the peloton in 2015th position, maybe, kind of having to break to not crash. But that caused Balsamo to have to break and ended up crashing. And then uh, there was a bit of a pileup and there was basically a group of 17 chasing, 17 to 20 riders chasing the front of the race. All the riders that crashed, three kilometer rule most likely on this parkour. So no worries when it comes to timing. But it really did disrupt the chase because then suddenly Henderson was off the front for a bit. I think Voss tried to use her for reverse lead out to make Kopecky mm-hmm. or cool chase. It didn't really work because no one, neither of them bit. And that basically just meant you have Henderson chasing um, Norsgaard. And so she's <laughs> not really going much faster. Plus the gap is huge. In fact, you know, if you, if I think if you went Marcus, then Henderson or Henderson and mm-hmm. Marcus lead out for Voss, they probably catch her. But yep. Norsgaard's are basically attacked uh, Skalniak Soika that she didn't wait for the sprint. She couldn't wait for the sprint because the peloton was closing in. That chicane with the tram tracks i got to say, it was quite tight, and yeah, I was not surprised. When I saw the break go through it, I was like, they're going to crash behind in that because <laughs> it's a hectic sprint finish they're chasing. So, don't know about that. I <laughs> couldn't find a last game that didn't have tram tracks in it, but um, <laughs> anyway. It's actually sad. <laughs> yeah. Norsgaard <laughs> goes clear, holds off Skalniak Soika, and most importantly, the peloton behind with Vibas, oh, not Vibas, Cole beating Kopecky. Kopecky was furious, though, but she kind of stopped. When Norsgaard crossed the line, she gave up. Voss fourth, Paladin fifth, Consoni sixth, 
Julie Deville to seventh, Mardalak eighth, Guazzini ninth, and Skalniak Soika was caught, but just hung on to come top 10. And so that's actually Norsgaard's first ever world tour win, which is somewhat, crazy. Yeah, a little bit surprising because when she broke on, like she came second in Omlope in 2021. She came second in Brugge de Pana in 2021, where she was the, actually the 10th best or like one of the best riders in the world, like really consistent results across across all her races and the classics, but she was second in a lot of them. And then, yeah, just never won a World Tour race because she's not, her sprint isn't, yeah, it isn't the best. Um, and so it's hard to win with that. With that. And so she did something yeah. different today and Movistar yeah. played a blinder again. Exactly. And that's the beauty of this. It's a, a team with not necessarily the top five sprinter in the, in the race anymore to the point that they're now excessively choosing to put her in the breaker, which I love. I love that that strategy. It's a gamble, but it pays off on this occasion. And otherwise, what would you have gotten with, with Northgard in the sprint? Maybe it's a, a four, five, six, seventh position in the sprint. I'd rather try and win from the breakaway at that point. Then they, they ended up pulling that off. And yes, there were things during the race that hindered the chase a bit. Yes, that crash might have been a, a reason for it. But that's one of the reasons that you go in breakaways and that you hope that something fucks up behind. Because if you're in the peloton and you leave it late, it probably wasn't a decision to leave it late this time around. But if they leave it late, then something can always happen. We saw it at Roubaix Fum, for example. There was a breakaway. They left it late. The gap was huge. And then a crash happened in the chase behind. And, well, the breakaway ends up winning. So this is one of those occasions as well where that might have influenced it. But I also think that it would have been close regardless. But um, that being said, it's a wonderful victory for Movistar. Second already in this race. And when it comes to GC, they're ahead of Volring at the moment in front of a very big day tomorrow. I think that team is very happy. And I think they've also made um, good team car decisions to also give a thumbs up to a team at some point. There's been a few wobbles a few times where there was like, a, oh, they should have done that or they should have done that. That was a bit of a mistake. But I don't think they've done major fuck-ups this race so far. I think Movistar have been really good. And same with Canyon Shram, i got to say. Canyon Shram, yeah. like... Okay, they didn't win today, nor did the, they get the podium in the stage they deserve, but they put their riders in a position to succeed. And, you know, most likely in a different world, Skowniak Soika at least comes second. That's better than you're going to get. They don't have a sprinter. So I think Canyon Shram have been good too. Um, but yeah, you already mentioned it, Benji. Tomorrow's stage, I've been hanging out for it. Like, there was a bit of a, it was a bit of a tease with the Van Vleuten and Volering attacks on the Carl to Rodez stage, and then they, they stopped. Because I was like, I really, I've been hanging out. I want to see the two big guns and anyone else that wants to join yeah. go head-to-head -head GC battling. That's what I've been waiting for since the Vuelta when it was so good uh, a month and a half ago. I just can't wait to see round two or round three if you include the Tour de France fam last year. So, but yeah, I can't wait for tomorrow. How will it play out, though? Because we've got this stage and if we take a look in-depthly at the parkour, there's also a, an initial flat part that intrigues me. It's 50 kilometers of flat. And if you are SD Works, if you are Movistar, do you care about people attacking the Peloton? Oh, not really, unless it's like Castellan or someone. Well, do they care about... Well, because she's closing GC, not because of QOM, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, because she's yeah. on one minute. Um, but yeah, it's from Lannemazan to Tourmalet Bagnier, 91 kilometers. As Benji said, 50 Ks flat. I think Kopecky's basically one green mathematically, so they shouldn't even worry about the intermediate sprint. Col d'Aspin, 12 K, 6.6%. That's quite hard. Like, I know 6.6% doesn't sound that hard, but we've seen that can split the race easily. And then there's a 13 kilometer descent. And then the Tourmalet, the first three, four, five kilometers are not so steep, even though the average is 7% over 17 Ks. But the last. 12Ks are really, really hard. Like, all average over 8%. A lot of them about 9%, 10%. It goes up to 2,100 meters. It's a super hard climb. It's much, much harder than Covadonga. It's harder than Lugunastanaya. It's harder than Petit Ballon, Platz of Arsel. It's harder than Super Planche or Planche de Belfi. It's an hour climb um, to over 2,000 meters. And I think Marlon. Um, not Marlon Royce, uh, Marion Roos said today, uh, a 20-second penalty, I mean, it's not truly correct, but if Volering has the same legs as Covadonga and is that much better than 
Van Vlerten, 20 seconds shouldn't matter for her tomorrow on this climb. That is true. It is intriguing to look at it, though, because I feel like the evolution of the year makes it very difficult for me to predict who's going to be better of the two. Because, like, you said it already, Vuelta was... Oh, Volgen was bad. Van Vleuten ends up winning because she benefits from P-Gate, but P-Gate was deserved. As in, it was a right to benefit, I would say, based on the analysis afterwards. But if we look at the Giro Don, then it's difficult to say, oh, Van Vleuten is so much better than in the Vuelta because we don't necessarily have the, the 1v1 there. So then we're looking at oh, who was behind her. Yeah, the gaps were huge, but was that necessarily as a consequence of of one mountain stage, or was it the entire way through? Stuff like that. So it's very difficult to compare Van Vleuten and Volring based on what we've seen so far this year against each other on a Tourmalet parkour and say, oh, this rider should be better than the other. Based on the hill stage, one would argue. I think I posted a poll on Twitter the other day, and I think 70% said that Volring would be winning the GC. That was with the fact that she was, um, I think, 12 seconds ahead or something in GC, but not sure if that was factored in by those people but that means that a lot of people believe that the hill qualities will shine through as well the factor that she was better than van vleuten on the hill stage will factor through on the mountain stage which isn't directly true right because it's kind of similar with pogacar and vingaga on on hilly parkour i would i would say pogacar but on mountain parkour i would say vingaga and here it's kind of the same where i'm like i'm not sure if volering is also at the top level on those mountains on Tourmalet against Van Vleuten, but it's going to be much closer than last year, that's for sure. I'm also, you know, it makes a difference. I don't know whether Van Vleuten will just attack anyway, because, you know, she's... Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how patient she'll be, frankly, but it should make a difference, the fact that Volring has to attack. If, the, if two riders are equal, like almost perfectly equal, even on 7%, it makes a difference that one has to pull and the other's in the wheel. So, But, but I think AVV will attack anyway. I think so as well, because... Last year, she kind of had to attack on the first mountain stage. But we need to add the factor that Van Vleuten probably thinks in her head, like she says about Amstel all the time. Oh, I need to do it from the bottom of the climb to make it as hard as possible to make sure I can benefit from my longer climbing over these punctures. Maybe she takes that strategy and puts it the same way on these mountain stages and just goes all in with the train. The train of Movistar tries to launch her like they always try and do. Maybe towards a satellite ride that is in the breakaway already. And maybe that's the factor that they'll do. And then they'll see if, if she can just keep on punching it towards the top and hoping that, that they can therefore just be better because of Van Vleuten's longer climbing is, is in their head maybe better. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think it's a big risk if I was in my play mm -hmm. defensively, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I... Does that benefit Volering's punch? Well, I think Volering... Uh, I would have been more confident in Volering, but the stress of this week, like, for sure, that whole team is just Jesus. a ball of stress, man. Like, yeah. all the issues with uh, not chasing, chasing, Danny Stam. Yeah. I think it's a... Uh, that's not the best way to prepare for the most important stage. But honestly, I think Volering should kill her tomorrow. I think she's the better pure yeah. climber right now, and... I think Volering wins with a big gap uh, tomorrow. Okay. Um, yeah, I think she, I think she looks good, uh, and she just got to stay calm, follow AVV initially, be patient, and then then do her thing and attack her. Um, but she, the thing is, on Kovadonga, she just attacked, kept pacing because mm -hmm. she had to gain a minute. Now yep. she has to gain what twenty? No, less than twenty seconds. Does she just say, "Oh, I can wait till the final K, attack you there, get the bonus seconds"? five, eight second gap, play it on the TT. It's not like a minute she has to make up. So, but yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think she wins uh, Volering tomorrow. And I think it, she puts it out of reach even in the TT. I don't really care who wins as long as it's with a close enough gap to make the TT interesting. <laughs> that's, that's my one hope tomorrow. But I also feel like if one gets dropped by the other, it's not going to be a small gap. And yeah. <laughs> it's a big climb. I feel like I'm more also leaning more towards Volring doing it, but my initial prediction of this race to counter your prediction of Volring was was Van Vleuten, and I might as well just double down and triple down and say Van Vleuten will will resurrect herself and prove the haters wrong. 
who do we think is the best of the podium contenders? Bauenfeind, uh, Longa Borghini, Mulman, Nivea Doma, got Castellan looking good on GC. She's up there. Liana Lippert, I don't see. Is this suiting Labu, Ludwig? Who do we like for those riders? That is a very difficult question, but personally, I'd be... I think Labu's better on longer climbs. Whether it's enough to compete with the others, she didn't look amazing in the first few days, but when it comes to the long climbing, I'm, I'm somewhat hopeful. I, um... Mormon's looking good with all the seconds she already gained. They're like, she, she actively has gained seconds. She's, she's second in GC. She's the highest of all the GC riders, technically. I think, I think it's going to be between Mormon and... I reckon Bath. I don't know. Based on the first few days, I'm not saying Baron Find. I'm saying Labu and Mormon. Probably Mormon. Uh uh, I think Nubia Doma is going to be good. Okay. I think she gets, she's going to pace herself well. Mm -hmm. I don't... Um, she, from memory, last year, she was actually quite... Unlike yeah. on maybe some medium mountain stages, but last year, I remember, she was actually quite conservative. Like in the Lamarckstein stage, she maybe dropped early, but then she came... I mean, there were such big gaps. It's hard. To, I mean, she dropped Elisa Longo Bagini by nearly two minutes on the Lamarckstein stage, and then on Super Planche de Belfi... She also dropped ELB again, and, and Labu, Persico, damn, Persico was so good last year. Yeah. Maybe, um, she, maybe she comes back. But, yeah, I think, there you go. Yeah, Nuvia Doma with her and Balanfine could cause some chaos tomorrow, that's for sure. In fact, you know, SD Works are really missing Nee Fisher Black here. They had her in the, in the Vuelta. She did the Giradonna where she, she came top 10. They yep. don't have anyone to set a pace for Volering. Like, Royster can set, but not, like, not for 5Ks on 9%, just for the first part. Like, she's going to have to attack early, or just yeah. the race is in Patino's hands. I think Movistar's just going to launch it. I straight up think they're going to do it, regardless of Von Flirten being behind on GC. All right. Probably they will. Um, otherwise, tomorrow there's also Classica San Sebastian, uh, 231Ks with pretty good start list but to be honest like you know it's the post tour race and i'm not ready to see i'm not ready to see <laughs> male riders who just did the tour de france again this soon um but yeah aj to got goal and o'connor and co but yeah remco is the huge favorite he's won the race twice he won last year before his welter prep in dominant fashion like a two minute ridiculous gap and um Crazy. Rodriguez is doing it too, even though he crashed. So I'm, I'm keen to see how he goes. And Ayuso, who crashed this week as well. UAE have probably got the second strongest team uh, after Remco. So, go, we, yeah. Uh, we forgot to mention one thing about PDFF. Uh, Hentela and her DS got thrown out. So that's Mormon's main DS that is out of the race. Really? Yeah. I mean, she's, she's experienced enough. I think she just knows what to do tomorrow at least to follow. But yeah, yeah it's... And SD Works only have one car they're using in the race, despite both Van der Breggen and Stan being licensed to drive it. And they have other DSs. It's all, it's all strange. But anyway, big day of racing tomorrow. Big, big oh. day of racing. I uh, can't wait to watch. Uh, can't wait to watch the GC action that we've been all waiting for before the TT on Sunday. But I hope you enjoyed the recap. Maybe there's more drama in the morning. Um, I don't think so, though. And we'll Hopefully see you with the not. recaps of those, those races tomorrow. Ciao.